Welcome everyone. Uh, today is June 22nd, 2019. Uh, I'm Dr. Terry Hildebrandt. Uh, today we have an evidence-based coaching professional series webinar. We have uh, three panelists that are going to be talking about their work in coaching for social justice and change. And our three panelists uh, come from a variety of different backgrounds and perspectives and uh, work that they're doing around the globe. I'm going to ask them to uh, introduce themselves more, more thoroughly in a moment, but we have Dr. Kate McAlpine. Uh, she's a researcher, strategist, and coach and director and founder uh, of the Doing Right Thing and CCR and ConnectGo. She is uh, in London, uh, but works uh, a lot in Africa. We have Sonia Narang. Uh, she's an architect of change and SKN Consulting, uh, and she's uh, doing a lot of work uh, in, with refugees uh, from the Arab Spring, and we have Zenobia Gaither. She's an entrepreneur, coach, teacher, mentor, and tutor. She's doing a lot of work um, with younger folks, and be, she'll be talking about uh, her exciting work in the area of, of social justice and social change. So uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, I'm going to start this out by uh, asking a few questions. Uh, so if each of the panelists could tell us about your journey of incorporating coaching into your work to support individuals and organizations in the area of social justice and social change. And if you wanna say a little bit more about your work in this first question, you're, certainly you're welcome to do that. And let's start uh, with Kate. Uh, so if Dr. Kate could tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, hi, um, thank you, thank you for having me on. I'm sorry for the, the music in the background. I've got some um, teenagers rocking. <laughs> sending them a flurry of messages to say, turn the tunes down. <laughs> um, my, my journey is, um, is, is, is feeling long these days. I went out to Africa just after my bachelor's degree. So that was back in 95 with, with the boyfriend who turned into the husband. And we went to Tanzania initially to, um, he's a conservationist. So he wanted to work in conservation. We planned for a year. And 25 years later, two kids later, um, we're still there. So um, I started to work with street children, actually. So um, again, very emergently, and I was a very naive, young 20-year-old. Um, kids were begging on the streets, and they kept you know, begging, begging, begging. And so I hooked up with a friend, and we started a soup kitchen. And that evolved to, to the point sort of seven years later that, that we were considered the best child protection organization working with street kids in, in East Africa. So street kids were really my way into coaching. I always have a strong, a strong sense of, of justice for young people particularly. I mean, in, in, in Africa, you look at the demographics and 50% of, of Africans are under the age of 50. In Tanzania, 75% of children have been victims of violence. So you look, at, you look at development and you say, unless we work with children and we work um, in the realm of safety and, and protection from violence, all the other development aspirations are, are null and void. So I was working directly with, with street kids and with direct service support. And when I had my own children, um, it just became harder and harder to do that, 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 that really intimate case management work. You know, you'd, you'd be in court um, defending a child who'd been raped and then go home and give the same attention and care to a two-year-old who'd scraped their knee. And I couldn't really cope with the dissonance of it. And at that point, I, I heard about fielding and, and did the OMD master's course. And, and this really gave me an entry point into looking at, at the health of organizations that are trying to do the right thing. So I moved more into strategy. And, and of course, if you move into strategy, you know strategy is, is always about people. And, and I became a, a fielding junkie and <laughs> ended up doing, God, what did I do? I ended up doing the EBC, then the integral certificate, than my PhD. So I think fielding has probably consumed 15 years of my life. Um, so I moved more into organizational development in organizations that are trying to help. And because the community of civil society in East Africa is pretty small, 
um, I started to, to be asked more and more to do coaching for um, young leaders in transition. So a lot of the civil society organizations in East Africa are sort of at that charismatic stage of development. They've, they've been initiated by somebody who, who feels an impulse to do the right thing. And then they, they get into it and realize, oh, this is, this is heavier and I don't quite have the toolbox I need. So a lot of my coaching took that form. Um, and then more recently, I've, I'm partially relocated to the UK and I'm doing a lot of work with women in construction. So I've sort of got a, a lot of my work now does look at research, um, still around child protection, but, but also um, research around how people thrive. And I've always taken a resilience lens to, to everything that I do. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm coaching women who are in leadership positions in construction and navigating what is a, 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 a fundamentally very conservative, um, pretty, So that's, that's in a nutshell where I am. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Kate. I think you and I may be one of the few people that have done four fielding programs. I, <laughs> I, I, I've actually done the exact same four that you have. <laughs> yes. I'm still an advocate of them. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Well, thank you. Thanks. All right, Sonia Narang, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about your work. Sure. Um, good day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. My name is Sonia Narung. Um, I actually started um, my research as doing cross-cultural psychology, um, acculturation, assimilation, and marginalization for first-generation East Indians, Pakistanis, and Bangladeshis in America, in America. And then I switched over to organization behavior because I love to study behavior in any setting. And um, I practiced um, organization design, development, and change management internally for American Express in New York, globally in India, as well as um, the Walt Disney Company in Los Angeles, the EMEA region, and then Sony Pictures Entertainment. So I did a lot of um, leadership development, change management, um, and as a byproduct of helping leaders go through change, you end up doing a lot of coaching. So I formally got my training under when Francine was in charge of the program at Fielding. And um, then some people know the story. I got diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder. It got pretty, pretty gnarly um, to the point where I was bedridden. And I had always been coaching immigrants and first generation people who were coming um, from India on assimilating or acculturating to the American job market. And I fortuitously um, knew some people who were in touch with uh, the Egyptian community. So for those of you who don't know, after the Arab Spring, about um, 800 people were killed for their uh, silent protesting. And then in the summer of 2013, about 22,000 people were captured by the military. Um, for their po peaceful protesting. And a lot of them were either captured, tortured, fled, arrested, and are still awaiting trial, or some were out of town for work and never were able to come back. So um, it was great because they didn't care what I looked like <laughs> and I could coach them um, as I was healing. Uh, so a lot of it was helping them uh, understand the American market for jobs, what to do with their story, uh, about a two-year gap in their resume, um, trying to get them so, uh, the services needed, along with the United States government for political asylum, um, that included psychotherapy, helping them figure out the market in terms of, there's a whole process with people seeking political asylum. They're not allowed to work in certain organizations. They have to first work hourly, um, and can't go, get cash, and then there's a big gap in their career. And most of these um, men and women are engineers, scientists, physicists, uh, who are working as pizza delivery people, or in construction, or gardening. Uh, so it's a huge transition for them and their family. Uh, so it was a privilege to get to work with them, and then it kind of just offsh it offshooted into working with people who've gone through trauma, so it ended up being more military vets, survivors of uh, sexual abuse, uh, people who've seen 
a lot of people in South Central who've seen a family member murdered, and it's all about helping them transition back into the workforce and being sensitive of all those nuances uh, because they get triggered easily with their PTSD. Uh, so it's just being alert and building a relationship with them that this is going to be a safe engagement. Um, so they help me heal. I'm helping them heal. It was a, a beautiful um, exchange. And uh, I'm still doing that as well as uh, some change management for some organizations as well as executive coaching for heads of groups uh, internally. I'm in LA, Cali girl, so um, it's a lot of entertainment, <laughs> a lot of Hollywood, a lot of filmmakers, uh, a lot of ego. So the um, working with the refugees and the survivors of trauma at least keeps me grounded. Right. <clears throat> Amazing story, Sonia. So we'll look forward to hearing more about all your work in just a moment. So Zenobia, if you wouldn't mind saying a little bit about what you're doing. Sure. So um, good morning. Good evening. Hi, all. I am originally from Chicago, and I was in Introducing Sochi. I was a scholarship recipient of an organization that provided scholarships to at risk youth to attend private high school of their choice. And it, within that scholarship organization, they offered so many things, but um, we actually received coaching from, well, a Dale Carnegie trainer that incorporated coaching where we focused on leadership development and um, interpersonal skills, which was pivotal for me at that moment of my life because I was having a really difficult time transitioning into high school. My parents were going through a divorce and I just felt completely out of place. But by the time I graduated from high school and went on to college, um, at Xavier University in New Orleans, I could see the benefits of having that assistance, that coaching throughout my high school career. And so it led me to do organized leadership development programs on campus for incoming freshmen and helping in their transition to college. And then I went on to start a literacy program for elementary schools within the surrounding areas. And then after I graduated, like most, I had no idea what I was going to do. And um, High Sight, actually, I volunteered for them every summer I went back home to do leadership development. And when I graduated, uh, the, the executive director offered me a position as the assistant program director. So I worked there for four years where I got to focus on um, helping at-risk youth transition into high school and then into college and then careers. And, um, and what I got to see within that time as an employee and not a scholarship recipient was that it was so much more than just the transition into those new infrastructures. It was really about um, helping them break generational patterns of thoughts and thinking and behaviors that um, had been destructive and we needed to figure out how they were kind of the, the responsible for changing that narrative um, in their families. And, um, and then I went on to do transitional services for non-traditional um, students ages 18 to 25 who did more vocational training. And, um, and now I'm in transition and um, exploring what those next steps are going to be, but I'm certainly still focused on underestimated groups um, and really empowering them to change the narrative and just figuring out how I'm going to create that space and what that feel and looks like to me. Excellent, thank you so much for uh, sharing your own journey and, and where, you, where you've been and where you're going in the future. How have you seen coaching change lives? So you've all worked with individuals that have been specifically uh, coming from some, you know, uh, places that have, you know, inherently had some challenges. So how have you seen coaching change their lives through the work that you've done? And let's start with Sonia. 
I think it's just giving a person the space to share their um, fears. A lot of the times I work with uh, Arabic men who um, are the most vulnerable to a lot of people. So at least for me, it's giving them a safe space to be vulnerable. Um, a lot of them don't want to talk about what happened in Egypt, particularly the entire torture and everything affiliated with that. Um, and I don't need to know the details, but we have to create a narrative to their resume where they feel safe to share that with a recruiter. Um, or some of them are afraid of getting labeled as Muslim terrorists. Um, when Ramadan comes around, the whole not being able to eat and fast and drink. So it's giving them a safe space to test out their assumptions about the American culture and actually try to help them to understand that there's more compassion out there than they actually think exists. Particularly everything going on with our current administration right now, it's a lot of arguing with them back and forth that not everybody is as um, unkind as what they're viewing in the media. Um, so I try to give them a safe space so they're brave enough to go take risks in the workplace, which we wouldn't really categorize as risks, but to them it's a big deal talking about their faith or talking about their history. Um, and I'm finding that with a, a lot of male clients, like where our sessions are usually on the edge of tears or in tears. And um, it's just giving them a lot of um, positive reinforcement and I'm hoping, I'm trusting in the goodness of humanity that people will treat them with respect and do dignity when they um, give them a little bit of vulnerability. So it's nice to know that someone who is working as a Domino's delivery pizza guy, who's a nuclear physicist, is now in Indiana, um, working at an organization that is truly thriving with his skill set. He recently got married, and America's been really kind to him which is um, when my dad came in the 60s from India, it was a very kind country to me and my family. So um, just hoping that more and more of them are seeing that kindness. And that's, that's what I'm kind of thriving off of, those stories. Well, some powerful examples. Kate, if you wouldn't mind sharing, you know, how have you seen coaching change lives? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm typically coaching um, women. Um, who are trying to do good in the world. And I think that the key change that they get out of coaching is a sense of sort of grounding themselves um, and a, a sort of newfound sense of confidence. I don't think they come at coaching feeling unconfident, but I think they, they often come at it feeling out of their depth. And, and, and in the coaching conversation, we're often really sort of... Um, challenging some of the assumptions they're making about um, if I do this, then this is going to happen. Um, and really helping them to articulate their, their views more succinctly and more powerfully. Um, they end up reframing their perspectives quite a lot. Um, and I, I'm, I'm pretty active about acknowledging and celebrating them for what they're doing. And I think that it just, it's, I think coaching often comes out as a sort of restorative experience more than anything else. Um, like you say, it's a space to, to be yourself um, and to stretch yourself knowing that the, the, the regard is there no matter what you, you do. Um, so I think that's really been the, the key thing for me. Okay, thank you so much. So Nobia, if you wouldn't mind sharing, how have you seen coaching change lives? I think that um, definitely every, I mirror everything that Sonia and Kate just said, but in addition to that, I also want to stress in addition to coaching the importance of seeing somebody like you in those atmospheres. Um, so in my first position, I was the first person of color to work within that organization and I think it was empowering for those students to see that one the program actually worked and if you do the work you will reap the results um, I think that coaching from me allowed them to allow them a space 
that where they could tell their story and somebody could actually relate to it, could actually relate to their story. And I think it empowered them to want to see things differently. Cause it, I mean, I got a lot of pushback about seeing things differently and um, just being exposed outside of their everyday environments. And I think that the most, the most significant change I've seen is that all of my students are now college graduates and have exceeded what they saw for themselves because I always knew that they were going to do well. But they, they've gone on to become college graduates. They're now in PhD programs. Some of them have their own business. Is their manager. So it's just to see the, um, the results of changing the narrative. Yeah, this is a big theme among all of you, right? Seeing new perspectives and being able to change the narrative and uh, really move people forward. So all great examples. So thank you all for sharing. So uh, I'm also curious, what do you see as the primary role of a coach in driving social change? And let's start with Zenobia. The primary role of a coach in driving social change. Oh, that's a great question. So I think that part of it is um, understanding who you are, um, having a sense of self-awareness, and how you fit into that larger system. And I think that um, my role, now that I have a better understanding of coaching, now that I'm in the lovely EBC, I think that the primary role of a coach as I move forward is to just give people the space and time, just the space and time to process. And um, I think that's the most valuable thing that I've learned throughout this EBC journey. It's just giving people the space and the time to feel heard. Wow. Very powerful. Especially in the times uh, that we have now where um, sound bites rule and yes. we have such little time for others, uh, even for phone calls, right? Uh, we yes. resort to texting instead. Um, what, what a powerful uh, statement. I would completely agree with that. Let's hear from Sonia. What, what, what do you think is the primary role of a coach in driving social change? Uh, I think for me, it's advocacy. So um, I work with a very privileged population during the daytime, like entertainment. Um, what, people are well paid, overpaid, probably. And um, when they ask, hey, what, who are you? What do you do? I usually lead with the stuff that I do outside of work. So it gives a platform to people who didn't know about the Arab Spring, what happened in Egypt. I'm allowed, and they go, oh, I didn't know that. Or I talk about um, the vets and what they've been through while transitioning back into civilian life. And they go, oh, I didn't know that. So, um, or I talk about the kids in South Central um, and the trauma they suffer. So it's just not, someone being a statistic, but there's actually a story behind it. And um, my clients, even prepping for this, I did my research. I'm like, what can I illuminate about the Arab Spring? And they were kind of shocked that someone cared enough. Um, and I'm like, well, you guys went through all this. And because it technically wasn't classified as a coup, um, the government didn't, the media didn't go as ballistic as it could have gone with Venezuela and what happened there. So I want to make sure their voices are heard. Um, I don't like calling them underdogs. I call them my badasses. Uh, I want to make sure their voices are heard on platforms, which they don't always get the um, airtime to talk about. So I think with that, when one person hears a story, another person hears a story, then they get curious and hopefully that motivates them to do something um, other than themselves. Excellent. So Dr. Kate, what do you see as the primary role of a coach in driving social change? 
I think um, in the, 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 with the clients I work with, it's really helping them to move from a reactive space to a, a, a sort of um, more intentional space um, so that they can sort of pace themselves and sustain their effort. Um, I'm really, I think a lot of um, my clients are working on the edge of burnout and, and coaching is really that space where they can come and decompress and, and, and sort of get a, get a sense of um, why, why they're in it. Mm. And, and you know reconnect with their motivation um so i think that's that's a really useful role that the coach provide excellent thank you so much so what impact um, have you like a, oh. an emotional role i think there's an intellectual sorry um just just to add i think there's a an intellectual role for a coach certainly in social change which is really supporting people to ask the the, the big powerful questions um, you know, the world rushes to solutions and doesn't really question deeply enough. And, and really, I use coaching for that a lot. Okay, thank you. So what do you see uh, the impact that you have seen uh, in coaching can have on social systems? So if you could speak to the impact you've, you've uh, witnessed uh, that coaching can have on the larger system. So let's start with uh, Sonia. Uh, I have a lot of people who don't want to do psychotherapy. And I, I don't understand what the, um, I, I peel through it, but a lot of people don't want to admit they're seeing a therapist when actually they most likely 99% of the time need to be seeing a therapist. Um, and particularly in the workforce, coaching is a little less stigmatized and it's kind of cool to have a coach. And, um, a lot of the times it turns into these sessions where it's usually about something deeper or greater or burnout um, or something that you had no clue was running through their mind. Um, so I think it's serving a vehicle to heal and to help organizations heal un unknowingly. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone expects to um, go into a coaching session and come out in tears, or at least the executives I work in. Um, so I think it's shifting and making people safer to look at those dark crevices of how they tick and how it manifests at work. Uh, it's just a safer stepping stone to it. And they come with a full package, right? A lot of history, a lot of legacy. And we touch on a little of it and dependent upon the scope of the sessions. Uh, at the end of the day, from, as, a, as a, a corporate coach, you're supposed to get some results, business results. But if they can get a little awareness of how something in the past or legacy is impacting their leadership, I think that's a profound influence in an organization, particularly um, post Harvey Weinstein with everything with Me Too. Um, there are a lot of dark crevices that are unexplored that we want to shine some light on. So whether it's through coaching as a stepping stone or then eventually going to therapy, it's just putting a little bit more illumination on it. And I don't think that hurts anyone, um, particularly in a big system like a corporate setting. Great. Thank you. And uh, we have a follow-up question from Nicholas, uh, Sonia. Uh, how do you transition the client from coach uh, advocating on their behalf to empowering the coachee to advocate for themselves? So for my um, Egyptian clients, uh, I actually punt them to my dad. Um, he's first, he, he's an immigrant. He came to this country with a turban. Uh, we're of the Sikh faith uh, from India, minority religion. And um, you know, they'll say all this stuff, Trump, blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, the deal is go take my dad to IHOP for breakfast and talk to a person that lived it in the 60s who had to cut his hair, who had to shave off his beard, who's been through hate crimes, um, who had to acculturate, brought 100 relatives over, um, talk to him, and then come back <laughs> and talk to me. So uh, they get a real-time session with my pops who uh, sits them down and tells them how he did it and 
compares and contrasts what the differences were in the situations. And um, then they kind of go, oh, snap. Like, they get a reality check about how they need to advocate for themselves. Um, and and my, dad's, my dad's amazing, and he just does this out of the goodness of his heart. Um, he kind of puts me in check when, I, when I'm dealing with um, people who come from another country, and uh, we have debriefs together. So I usually unleash my dad on them. <laughs> and then have a heart to heart at IHOP over a five dollar breakfast of pancakes, and uh, it's a remarkable experience for them because then they feel, oh, if he did it, and he had a turban, a beard, didn't speak English as fluently as I did, um, then I can do it. Excellent, thank you. Zenobia, any thoughts on the impact you've seen coaching have on social systems? And I know you worked a lot in the educational world, so if you would. If you're open to sharing about that, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so I haven't had, I have not directly been a coach in any corporate setting or nonprofit setting, any business setting, but I do have experience in, I think indirectly of always coaching somebody and teaching somebody. I think that I always bring a different perspective to the table um, because of my background and my experience. And um, um, I think that what coaching, what coaching could allow, because I haven't seen it in corporate, but what I think it allows for is people to understand that there is not a separation of work and personal life. And I think that um, when we go into these businesses, we, we want to show up as a different person, but who you are at home is who you're going to be at work. Like you don't just get to leave that person at the door and decide that you want to be a different person than it when you get to work. So I think that, um, and this has always been my trouble within businesses is that there's this huge separation of personal and business. And I think that coaching allows a space to see that all of those work together in making a person who they are, whether it's successful in the workplace or not. So I think it's an empowering tool that uh, should be utilized more often. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the things I say um, in my own work and at Fielding is that every executive coach is a life coach, right? Uh, you can't be an executive coach without being a life coach, meaning that, you know, we bring our whole selves to our work uh, and that's who we are. Um, also, work-life integration has been a new term. Work-life balance has kind of fallen out of vogue and work-life integration is a new term that people are using because, uh, you know, with this 24-7, always connected, always on infrastructure we've that our high-tech uh, friends have created for us enables us to to never turn off, right? So it becomes a challenge, right? And that's yes. true for coaches as well. Yes. Um, so there was another uh, comment. Uh, Patrick, do you want to speak to your comment if you want to turn on your audio and video for a second about coaching and and and, uh, and therapy? Yeah, I appreciated what Sonia said, but um, I'm doing a lot of work and there's a lot being written these days. If we're going to talk about emotional intelligence, there's got to be some use of emotional intelligence. So in the coaching conversation now, there's a lot of talk and I just gave a keynote on how to go deep in coaching without being a personal archaeologist. You know, we don't have to dig up the person's past, but there is something under the surface a lot. And if we're just doing transactional coaching, we miss the opportunity for transformational coaching. Anything tied to passion is going to have emotions. So there's a lot written about, you know, emotions are just energy and motion. We have to be, I think we coaches can be the place where emotions are shared. And if a person's not stuck in emotions, then they're coachable. You know, they don't need to see a therapist. Great. Thank you for that. So I have one last question prepared for the, uh, for the panel. What advice do you have for other professional coaches wanting to create a more just world. And let's start with Dr. Kate. 
Um, thank you. Um, well, you know, of course, coaches should not be giving advice, should they? Thank God. <laughs> um, so what advice do I have? Um, I'm not... I think it's, it's a little bit what Patrick was saying. It's, it's, you know, I don't see much value in transactional coaching. I think, you know, if you're going to, um, if you're going to do coaching, do deep coaching that enables people to be fully authentic. And, you know, I think, you know, there's a relationship between the more we can be authentic and, and the more justice we'll see in the world. Um, so I think it's, it's, is action Patrick said I think go deep um that would be my my advice okay thank you Sonia any thoughts yeah I'm gonna build on that I go deep and I know my boundaries so I work with a lot of um bipolar and PTSD and um I would try to fix it all and it's out of my scope of training um so i completely agree go deep and as a coach know your own boundaries and that there are other people that can help the whole person great thank you zadobia thoughts on what you think uh, any advice you have for professional coaching wanting to do create a more just world um so my observation is that um, there's still a huge focus on executive coaching, and um, I think that I think that 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 executive coaching the what that looks like needs to be broadened. I think that we have a um, a number, you know, underrepresented groups still hold the highest numbers of underemployment and unemployment, and they're often not seen as high potential employees. So my suggestion is that we not forget about those, because I was once viewed as somebody who was not high potential, but the moment that I got the coaching I needed, you know, my high potential showed up. It emerged because it's, it was always there. Yeah, thank you. I think this is a really powerful um, thing to keep in mind that uh, coaching uh, can change the world within organizations, you know, even in your backyard, right? Uh, which kind of leads us to the question Heather has put into the chat. Heather, would you like to come on live and uh, share your question? Sure. Hello. Um, yeah, my question's around um, what are the, you know, what's your opinion on kind of the skills, competencies that are needed for those who are really coaching others who are leading change um, transitions? Mine's more, I'm interested in kind of a corporate context, but um, yeah, we're really looking at kind of uh, skills and competencies, training for HR professionals, and how they can help coach leaders through lead you know through leading a change great excellent so we're you know this is a great uh specific question around how coaching uh leaders with change leadership is what i usually call it or change management a anyone like to share their experience because i know a number of you do coach in this space uh, um, yeah i mean i'm happy to to say something quickly um i think that the key thing that i notice is um, the, the weakness in organizations around co-creation of change. And I see a real role for, for um, coaches to do some hand-holding with leaders who are in the midst of, of change processes around how do you co-create processes with people. Um, you know, I think we, 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 in organizations, we tend to talk the talk. We know what the sort of claimed values should be around things like co-creation. And then when you look at them in action, you see the way <laughs> workshops are facilitated and, you know, oh, yes, that was that was co-created. And you're like, OK, this really isn't. So, you know, building their, their toolbox on that, I think, is, is really helpful. And I think that can be done in a coaching conversation because you can um, you can sort of um, 
practice scenarios so well in a coaching conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else like to comment on, on Heather's question? I think for me, I first like to understand what their um, lens is of change, how they approach it, do they like it, do they hate it, um, and then what do they want their brand to be during the change and after the change. Um, so I have one young executive who came in like Thor, like he just came in with his hammer and was like, I am, I have sponsorship, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And, you know, dazzling blue eyes, blonde hair, British accent, and just, like pissed everyone off. And I was like, well, was that your intent? He was like, no, my intent was to come in more like Captain America. Um, I'm like, okay, so now let's rewind and think about this Captain America visual and how are you going to backtrack and uh, help people through the change. Uh, but his, in, in, his intent was to do what was for the best interest of the company. Uh, he just he, he just didn't think thoughtfully through it and go, okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to do it? And how am I going to come out looking through this to the other end when the change is complete? So um, superheroes happen to work with them. So that was a reference point we used. Great. No, I love that. The personal branding along to this. We so much, we can so easily get into what is the process of change management and right. how am I going to get into this? And this is how I'm going to change the org. And it's like, how are you showing up as a leader in that yeah. and allowing our HR professionals to um, let leaders step into that, not it be delegated. Right. <laughs> so, right. Thank you. I like that. That's, that's great. Yeah. Excellent. And, uh, and by the way, uh, we're going to, Heather, Heather and others, we're going to be uh, talking about this particular topic more next month. Uh, we have another professional series webinar on how coaching and organization development work together and how OD professionals, you know, also HR professionals uh, who are mostly uh, working in the OD profession uh, can use coaching. And certainly OD is all about change and leading change. So that'll be a big topic for next month. If you want to call back in, uh, we'll talk about that here at the end. Uh, and you're welcome to continue this dial dialogue around uh, coaching for leadership and change. Um, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So Sue, I saw you coming online. Did you have a, I know you have a comment. Did any questions coming up for you? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, great. It's great. Yeah, it's great discussion, though. I really appreciate the work everyone's doing and the insights shared. Perfect. Any last questions uh, that are from the audience that anyone would like to talk about regarding uh, social change or social justice? Yeah, this is uh, <clears throat> Darius. I don't know if you can. Yes, see Darius, you. we can hear you. And you can turn your gotcha. video on if you like. Okay, Zoom would like access to your camera. All we right, see, we you. see you. Right. We're, we're good. <laughs> okay, it is a little delay. All right, so my question is more about the journey of going into this thing um, called coaching and even how that has, um, you know, organically uh, led into, from what I'm hearing, um, this, this idea where you're able to tap into more of the social justice and, the, the, you know, the, the topic of, the, of this webinar. And so, um, you know, in very simple terms, I guess the question is, is this something that, um, how does your vision now of what it is that you're doing professionally, um, how did that evolve? Um, because this is not one of those things that, um, you know, when you're in K-12, you know, we're gonna go visit, you know, the fire station and then right after that, we're gonna go visit the coaches, you know, it's like something that, uh, is, is quite new. Um, and for me, it's about three or so years new. So um, if you all could comment on that, um, I'd appreciate it. So Darius, if I understand your questions, how did, how, do you, how did this become a profession for you or how did you decide to get into coaching? <clears throat> right, well, I mean, how did, you know, how did you become comfortable with, you know, like solidifying in like, yes, this is what it is. It's coaching and I feel like I'm doing uh, maximum impact with all of my professional skill and even, um, you know, what was uh, mentioned earlier, how, you know, personally, this is edifying as well. Um, mm -hmm. How did that come to coalesce, I guess, in so many words? Great. Excellent. Okay. Who'd like to start? 
Uh, I mean, I can certainly start with, the, with the, almost the, the view you don't want to have, which is I'm not sure that um, <laughs> I do a lot of other stuff. So I'm, I'm a social entrepreneur. I do OD stuff. I do research. I do facilitation and I do coaching. And of all the social justice sort of if you were to weigh how much of it is social justice oriented, I'd say the coaching was the least of all of that. Um, because of that, that great, great question you had around how does it affect systems? I think in terms of affecting systems change, coaching is the, is the least effective intervention because it deals with the individual. So you can't affect scale very easily. Whereas with, with a lot of the other work, um, you can really start to influence the, the nature of, of, of community dynamics and, and organizational relationships and government functioning. So um, I, got into co I got into social justice work and coaching became a bow to the, what do you say, an arrow to the bow or whatever, you know, another arrow that I had. Um, I didn't start, I never aimed to be a coach in order to affect social justice ends. So the nuance is slightly different. Um, for me, I didn't, um, you know, I'm Indian. I'm either supposed to be a doctor, a lawyer, or engineer by trade. That's what our parents expect. Um, so, but my faith is all about uh, protecting and helping other people. So I, I did the corporate route. I did, you know, wanting to become a vice president, organization development, design, change. Um, I did that whole narrative. And then when you get sick, shit happens. Um, and things change. And your perspective changes and what import, what's important changes. So I found more joy from coaching than I did from anything else. Um, but it's a, it's not my bread and butter. My bread and butter will always be OD change management. Uh, but my intent is to democratize coaching. So one thing I would say is never say no, whether it's a millennial, whether it's a teenager, whether it's a, someone who's just new to the country, if someone's looking for coaching, just coach, because if that's what you want to do, it doesn't really matter what the niche is. Um, and the work will come. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I would say that social justice has just been my thing. My, I, I've always been in between Oprah and Angela Davis. That's how my mom and my dad described me. And um, I, like you, Darius, the, the coaching as a profession is really new to me. Um, I just so happened to be coaching one of my colleagues through at who she wanted to negotiate a raise and we were on the train home and she we're talking about how she can negotiate her raise and she's like you should be a coach and that was eight years ago like well I don't even know what that means and it wasn't until um I started looking for a coaching program and I couldn't find one that I felt like was suitable. And so I went and got my executive master of leadership at UFC. And then I end up finding, and that's how I end up finding about, finding out about fielding. And I'm not, I think like, Hey, I'm not sure that coaching is like, um, the profession that I want to be in. Like now that I'm coming to a close, and getting ready to graduate, I'm rethinking everything that I thought about it. Like, um, I don't really want to build a coaching practice. So, but I, I'm happy to have this skill and the framework. And now I'm trying to figure out how do I use that skill and that framework to continue the work that I've been doing. Um, but um, in a different way, because I really don't want to coach people through high school and college and and careers. So um, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I think this is a really important point that, you know, coaching skills can uh, really enhance any of the other work you're doing, you know, no matter whether you're an OD, an HR, or an, or an executive. And part of our purpose in doing these uh, evidence-based professional series webinars is to show how coaching is impacting 
kind of multiple areas of life. So, so thank you for sharing your own journey that, you know, even though you may not choose to be a, a coach uh, as your primary um, source of income, you can still use these skills in so many different ways to impact the world. Absolutely. Yes. So we have time for one more question. Anyone else uh, from the audience or perhaps even from the panel, um, any question that you might have? I have, a, I have a question, if you can hear me, Terry. We do, and you can, if you wouldn't mind turning your, on your video, that helps us see. You, I can't, you've got me blocked. Oh, oh I have you blocked. Uh, is that you, Patrick? Yes. All right, let me see if I can turn that on. There we go. Okay, so, yeah, so I, I got on this call thinking we might also talk about the piece of social justice with uh, incarcerated individuals and those returning citizens. I'm doing a lot of that. If people want to know more information, I'd love to share. But I've had a joy that uh, 2012, I had a federal prisoner write me, was reading my book and doing some peer coaching. And it so happened that the assistant warden was a coach you graduate. So we donated our curriculum from my institute so they could train over 100 men over five years. Now there's a woman I'm sponsoring that's doing it in New York with women. Long story short, it's touched my heart greatly. I'm now doing a mentoring with nine men who were in that federal pen, and they're out, and they're going to be applying for their ACC. They've completed 80 hours. They've completed the test. They've completed the oral, and it's just heartwarming. They're doing great things with coaching both directly with probation departments and youth centers, et cetera, or indirectly in their place of employment. So that's something I'm very interested in. <coughs> Great, thank you for sharing your own journey and uh, your own application. Any last comments that we want to have from the panel? I'm gonna give everyone uh, some closing remarks and then I have just a couple of announcements uh, before we close today. So who'd like to start with any closing remarks today? I'll start. So I really, um, when I decided to apply to e, uh, fielding EBC program, I was really, I'm, re I'm all about mission statements. Like I'm all about the why. Um, and so reading the mission statement and part of it talking about social change and how fielding is used as a platform for social change. So um, it was nice to be able to have this panel to see how other people are incorporating coaching for social change. Because I, I, I love the program. I think sometimes heavily it, it focuses on coaching within corporate settings or traditional settings. And so it's, in, in my mind, you know, it doesn't operate like that. So it's nice to see so it's nice to hear Sonia and Kate's journey of how they uh, been using coaching and for social justice and, and within, you know, corporate settings, which I really don't always grasp. So thank you, Terry, and everybody for putting this together. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I guess the only thing I have to say is uh, if something's annoying you right now or pissing you off, like with everything going on in the world, do something about it. So um, I have limitations health-wise, but I find coaching as a way to help uh, those who are going through a tough time right now in the world. So I'm not just standing by idly. I'm actually trying to do something about it. Um, so if you can use that energy and motion to do good, why not? Great. Thank you, Sonia. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, just one thing to say. I mean, the greatest joy I have out of coaching is, is these, these intimate relationships with fantastic people. And I think, you know, that's ultimately what we all strive for in life, isn't it? Is to be, you know, seen and heard and, and, and you know, recognized. And I think that's really the, the fundamental power of coaching for, for the client and for the coach. Great. Well, thank you all uh, for you know, spending your Saturday with us, whether it be Saturday morning or Saturday evening uh, in mm -hmm. the case of Kate, and for all of our uh, uh, audience members and, and for those who will be watching this video later. And uh, we do these uh, meetings twice a month, and I just want to uh, give you a little bit of more information 
about uh, fielding and how you can continue to be a part of this uh, journey that we're all on. Uh, if you go to our main website, coach.fielding.edu, you'll see a number of uh, buttons that you can access. And this video that we ha have created today will be located here under professional series videos. If you click on that, uh, you can watch all of our previous uh, webinars related to um, coaching in the professions. We also have our thought leader series. These videos are dedicated to research. Uh, we have a PhD and EDD program that um, does a lot of research and coaching, and our students are constantly producing new knowledge, and they uh, often present those uh, once a month to the world so that you can learn uh, what is new in coaching and different trends that are coming forward. We also have a blog, uh, and our, at our blog, we announce all the upcoming webinars. So the, the next one um, that will be uh, showing up in July uh, is related to um, evidence-based coaching and around in inclusiveness in providing women of color access to coaching. And one of our faculty members, uh, Dr. Charlyn Green Farid, will be talking about her work. Uh, so please join us on July 10th, uh, and that's a Wednesday from four to five. Uh, and here, uh, uh, Dr. Charlyn, she's done some amazing work for 30 years in this space. Uh, we also have um, another uh, webinar coming up on OD as well, so coaching in OD, which will be uh, later in July. So you can stay tuned and um, be aware of, of all of our upcoming webinars by checking out our blog. Uh, if you're interested in joining our community of practice, uh, anyone in the world who has interest in coaching can join the community of practice where we share information uh, and resources uh, at that uh, uh, I'll relate to everything coaching. We also have opportunities for publishing uh, in addition to our annual conference. Uh, so you can stay tuned by joining our community of practice by going to ccop.fielding.edu and uh, stay, stay in touch with us that way. So thank you all for attending today and uh, specifically thanks to our panelists. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you uh, in the community of practice or at one of our uh, webinars in the upcoming months, uh, and have a great Saturday. Oh, you, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Sir. Bye. Bye, everyone.